Hey gang, here's the um, lecture on the rare uh, null models test package or the rare NM test package that um, we briefly talked about uh, before we went on break. Um, so this package is described in the paper that's on the screen here. This is uh, ecological and biogeographic null hypotheses for comparing rarefaction curves. This was published in ecological monographs in 2015 and by a couple of, well actually three people that um, have produced a lot of R packages and a lot of science related to this idea of rarefaction or subsampling data to get an idea of how species are accumulating across different levels of effort or number of individuals that were collected or um, completeness of the samples. Um, so it's a way of thinking about the accumulation of um, species diversity. Um, and, and we'll go over in this lecture how we think about some of those um, metrics of, of species diversity. Um, so this is ecological monographs. Those tend to be longer reads and, and um, more complex papers, but I'll just show you a couple of the conceptual diagrams from this paper that, that are to the point of this R package that was created based on this paper. Um, so this is the first figure from that paper. This is a conceptual diagram for their two null hypotheses that they've created here. One being the ecological null hypothesis. That's what the H sub zero eco represents. Um, and, and that null hypothesis is thinking about two collections of species um, coming from the same underlying distribution in terms of um, species composition, that's what the C represents, so the identities of the species that are in each of those collections, um, the richness or number of species that are in each of those, um, and then the relative abundance or the um, kind of um, cross-section of, of um, the number of very abundant species versus the number of rare species. And I'll, I'll show you an example of what a relative abundance profile looks like. Um, so A here in this conceptual diagram would be the condition where the um, all three components of the um, ecological null hypothesis are, are supported. The gray circles nested within that represents the biogeographic null hypothesis. And here we're thinking about collections that may have come from two different locations uh, where the composition of species, the identity of the species may change over time but richness may not change or the relative abundance or the profile of relative abundances may not change between those two um, collections. So we can think about it in, in a spatial context, thus biogeographic or an ecological context where maybe we're sampling the exact same site through time. We have questions about whether or not components of diversity have changed through time. B here shows the condition where um, the null hypothesis for the ecological null hypothesis is not supported. So uh, composition of the um, collection one is not equal to composition of the second collection, but components of the biogeographic null hypothesis are supported. Uh, and then panel C here, these three kind of clusters of, of circles represent um, other iterations that could come from that where maybe species richness is not identical so, so that your null hypothesis for the biogeographic null hypothesis is not supported or um, relative abundance is not equal or, or perhaps both. So you can have these different levels of, um, of, un, of um, non-support for the null hypothesis. Uh, and so here's an example of what we're thinking about with these components of diversity. So species richness is probably most intuitive. That's just the count of species that exist at a site. You get a single, single value. If there's only one species, the number you get is one. Um, composition is the identity of species. So in the previous lecture in the vegan package, we talked about this idea of turnover. You may have five species at two sites, but the composition may differ if a couple of those species are not the same. So species richness doesn't really tell us much about the composition of, of a community sample. Um, and then relative abundance is what this plot represents. So this is a rank abundance curve. So this is um, the rank of the species from one being the most abundant, two being the second most abundant, and so on from there, versus relative abundance um, here shown on, on a log scale. Um, so, so that you have this 
profile where there are a few very abundant species and then a larger number of rare species. And this is a pretty typical pattern in community ecology where we tend to see a few species that dominate communities and then this large number of much rarer species. And this is typically at this end of the curve where we're seeing this idea of turnover happening. Usually we have this you know, small number of species that tend to be everywhere and then, and then there's these other rare ones. So, so when we say relative abundance, we're thinking about this profile of uh, abundances relative to each other. Um, and so we'll just go through the two. I'm going to move my little inset over here to show you that this is the ecological null hypothesis. This is the conceptual diagram that came out of this um, paper from 2015. Uh, and it's just showing basically where we start in this upper left. This is an observed abundance matrix. So it's very small text. You can read the paper and, and in the caption of this figure, they say, well, you're not really supposed to be able to make out the text that's there. It's just kind of showing the idea uh, that there's a, a matrix. So um, what it has is species one, species two, species three, and so forth, site one and site two. And then this third column is pooled data, where we're just adding the abundances of those species to create this pooled um, data set. Um, and, and then what um, panel A here is showing is across a gradient of sample sizes, which could be the number of collections that you make or the number of individuals that you collected, we should see an accumulation of richness. So take, for example, sample-based rarefaction where you go out and you make one collection at one location, um, then you go out and you make a second one, you would expect to find more species with more effort. Uh, if you made a third collection, you would expect to see more species but, but uh, species richness in this case does not increase forever. There is an accumulation of, uh, at some point, you've sampled enough that you found most of the species that exist there. That's what these curves represent, this idea of an accumulation curve. Uh, and then rarefaction is just a way of uh, constructing these curves and then comparing them, in this case, between two sites. So here, this column site one, this is what that curve might look like. Uh, for site two, this is what that curve might look like. And then for the pool data, that's what B is showing here. So we can create this pool data where if we, if we uh, think about um, those two sites combined, notice that there's many more species there uh, in, the, in the sample size increases because we're combining those two sites. And the kind of clever advent with this approach that came from this paper um, is just comparing those two. So you've got our pooled data curve that exists here. Then I want you to notice that this curve from site one is this same curve here. And what they're doing is creating an area that differs along the entire length of that curve. That's what this A1 represents, this shaded area here. Um, and, and the idea there is we're not comparing species abundance at any point along the curve. We're comparing the whole area along the curve. And notice the same comparison between the pooled curve uh, and site two here is this A sub two. Notice it's a larger area. There's a greater difference between the pooled curve um, and, and the um, site two curve there. So then you get this Z statistic. This is the observed Z statistic. It's equal to the area of um, the difference between site one and the pooled data plus the difference between um, site two and the pooled data. So you get this Z equals a1 plus A2. Uh, and if I move this over to the side, notice this arrow represents, you get this observed statistic value um, that can be compared to a distribution of randomization. And that's what D is showing here. So if you randomize this matrix, move the abundances of these species between those columns in a very randomized way, you can um, create site one and site two that would, would come about randomly. You compare that to the pooled data and you get a Z statistic. And then you do that again, you randomize the communities again, and you calculate a Z statistic. And you can do this in the case of this R package 200 times. And what this um, panel E shows here then is that you get this frequency distribution that approximates a normal distribution of Z values that accumulate through all these randomizations. And then you get 95% confidence intervals. So that's what these dashed vertical lines represent. And you end up with an observed value that you can compare to the distribution of randomized values. And if your observed value lies outside of the 95% confidence intervals of that curve, um, what you might conclude there is that there is a significant difference in the species accumulation at site one versus site two. 
functional number of species is higher at site one based on this curve being higher than, than this curve. So that's the idea of the um, ecological null hypothesis. We were thinking about sampling the same site through time generally is, is where we would apply that and thinking about whether or not species diversity has changed through time. And, and here you can do it with as little as just two samples. Um, the other one then that came from this paper was uh, the biogeographic null hypothesis. And this is where we're thinking about um, perhaps multiple sites that were uh, visited where we don't necessarily expect to see the same composition, but we would expect to see similar species richness or uh, the profile of relative abundance. And, and notice we have the same matrix here where we have these three sites. Uh, we can create these uh, accumulation curves for each of those sites. We, we create the pool data, but notice now it's pairwise comparisons. Uh, oops. It's pairwise comparisons between the pool data and site two. Here's the pool data versus site three. Here's the, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So you get your Z observed that is actually um, areas from three different comparisons. Then you can compare that to the same randomization procedure there. Um, and, and get this, this basically same interpretation of the output, but here um, thinking in the context of um, biogeography, we might be comparing sites that differ in their location, and so historical zoogeography may have contributed to different compositions from those places we might expect the same richness. Um, so you interpret this very, very consistently with the ecological null hypothesis. Um, to use this R package, that's kind of the basic things that you need to know. Um, you, there's um, options in there to think about things beyond just species richness. Um, this idea of um, hill numbers uh, symbolized as Q it, within the R package. I'll show you that in a moment. We can think about species richness or we can think about the exponential Shannon index. This is a hill number um, where we take the, the, the Shannon index, take the ex exponential of that, um, and it scales in a way very consistent with species richness. Um, or you can do Q equals two. This is the, the hill number two inverse Simpson index. And just as a reminder, if you've um, spent any time thinking about diversity indices, you've probably heard about the Shannon index, um, usually shown as H, where we're, where we're showing a negative summation of relative abundances for um, species one through S being the total number of species. So we're just summing across all of the species and we're multiplying the relative abundance times the log of the same species relative abundance. Then you take the exponential of that to get this exponential Shannon index. The nice thing about this R package is it does all of this for you. You just put in raw abundance data and it calculates either species richness or the exponential Shannon. Here's, an, here's a breakdown of uh, the Simpson index that you may have heard of. So here D is equal to Again, a, a summation from the first species to the total number of, across the total number of species that you have. But here, it's relative abundance P sub I um, squared. So we, we can think about diversity not as just the raw count of species that exist there, but we can use some of these diversity indices like the Shannon and Simpson indices. Um, the other thing that you can do with this R package is you can rarify across samples. That's the one that we've talked about so far, sample-based rarefaction. But you can also uh, rarify across the individuals that were collected or individual-based rarefaction. And the idea there is if you collect more specimens, a larger number of individuals, you might expect to see a larger number of species or a greater Shannon index or greater Simpson index. Um, so it's either effort in terms of the number of samples that you collect that be sample-based or the number of specimens that you collect that's individual based. And then more recently, coverage based was identified, and this is where we're thinking about sample completeness. So of all of the species that exist within an area, um, what per, per, uh, portion of those do you collect within a single collection? And, and if you, uh, in a sample, collect a greater fraction of the species that exist there, you have a more complete um, um, sample or broader coverage. And, and so coverage-based rarefaction is a relatively new spin on rarefaction. Um, so I'm going to change the screen that I'm sharing here from PowerPoint to R Studio. And here I have um, an R script that I'll load onto eCampus um, so that everyone has access to what we're going to go over here. But this is just where we're going to dive into uh, a little bit of the 
rare NM tests package. So this is available on the CRAN. You can install it. Remember, um, you can go to tools, install packages, uh, and then and then a um, a graphic user interface will come up, and you can go to the uh, CRAN and, and install this package. Um, once it's installed on your computer, you just hit run, and, and then um, on this uh, argument library, rare NMS, rare NM um, tests, and, and notice that it requires some related packages, including vegan, the one that we just talked about last week, um, and you're ready to go. Um, just like the vegan package, there's data that come with this package. So here we have um, tree abundance data and 224.1 hectare plots in three montane cloud forest regions of Mexico. So the data here is Chiapas. And so if we hit data, uh, quotations around the name of that data set, notice that we'll get these 224 observations of 376 variables. And if we um, click on that, um, notice that the first column is the region, and there's three regions here. And then it's um, the um, abundance of species um, as, we, as we move across there. So notice there's some zeros, two, four, this, these are just counts of these um, tree abundance. So um, it's a matrix, just like we were thinking about in the vegan package of um, species going across the top time site sites going along um, the rows here. And, but the first column is, is an identifier for the region from which those, those um, sites were collected. Okay, so there's the data that we'll be dealing with in our um, example today. So we can start with the ecological null hypothesis. Remember, this is where we're thinking about uh, community composition, the species richness that exists there, and relative abundance profiles, thinking about all of these things simultaneously. Um, and what I'm going to do here is in this first line 12 is just um, create an object called two dot samples. So I'm only going to pull two of those um, rows from, from that Chiapas data set. And I'm going to create this thing called two dot samples. I'm just using the same indexing that we've used here throughout the semester. Uh, where C, uh, and remember anything inside of these brackets that comes before the comma represents rows, everything that comes after represents columns. I'm just grabbing row one through two, and the negative one represents I'm dropping that first column that, rep that uh, identifies the region from which the samples came. So I'll create this uh, object called two dot samples. Notice we have now two observations of the same 375 species, but we've dropped that one column that represented the region from which the, the data were collected. So then on the next line, I'm just creating an object called um, IBECOQ0. And so this stands for individual based, meaning that we're going to think about the accumulation of species richness across a gradient of the number of individuals that were collected. That's the idea of individual based. It's the ecological null hypothesis. And we're doing it with the hill number Q0, which is species richness. So the function is ecotest.individual. Um, we're going to do it on this uh, object that I just created called two samples. Margin equals one represents the fact that the species are columns and the collections are rows. If you had that um, transposed, you could do margin equals two. It just depends on the way that you um, are storing your data or, or the way that you inherit data if you're analyzing others' data. Um, power function here represents the um, um, total number of um, specimens that are used to, uh, to collect the, or, or to create the gradient of, of a number of individuals collected. So we don't usually run all the way up to the total number of individuals that are collected. In this case, we're using only 80% of the total number of individuals that were collected. That's that power function. Uh, and then Q equals zero, that's the, actually the default, but I specified it there as a reminder to, to uh, mention it. We're gonna be thinking about um, standard species richness here as opposed to the exponential Shannon or the inverse Simpson, which would be Q equals one and Q equals two respectively. So I'm gonna run this. Uh, line of code. Notice it's going through this randomization. It's telling you this is randomization number and we're going, um, we started at one, and the default in this package is to run 200 randomizations. 
Uh, then it tells you it's an individual based method and it tells you your p-value with the probability of having an, um, um, an observed difference between those that's um, less than or equal to your, your null hypothesis. So essentially, if you have a value less than 0 0.05, what that's telling you is that there's a significant difference in the species diversity between those two samples. Um, the next thing that I have here is um, just a plot for that. So I'm using the, because these plots are um, pretty complex, just, just the basic plot that comes out of this package, I'm using this windows open close argument so that the plot will come up in a new window instead of trying to fit it into the plotting window that's here. Uh, and then I'm just using plot as the function and I'm calling it on this object individual based ecological null hypothesis on Q0. Um, so I'm going to run that and then uh, what I want to do is share the screen. Uh, let's see, here we go. And you should now see um, if this is working properly, uh, the graphic that comes from, from plotting this. So we have across the top ecological null model test. It tells you your p-value. Um, and this um, plot should look very familiar if you think back to those conceptual diagrams that I showed you um, that came out of the paper that was published in ecological monographs. The bars represent the distribution of our um, z-values from the randomization. We have the median value here. We have the lower 95% confidence interval, upper 95% confidence interval. And then way out here, notice this is a break on this x-axis. Our observed value was, um, was 697. Um, suggesting that there is a large difference in the accumulation of species between these two samples, much greater than what we would expect to arise from random processes. Um, this lower left portion of the um, graphic shows our rarefaction curves. So the dark black curve is the pooled species data. Then we have site one that's just above it. And then we have um, site two that's below it here. Notice we're calculating these areas that exist along, this, um, along each of those curves to create this um, Z statistic. Uh, and then what they show you is just a single randomization. Remember, there were 200 randomizations that were done as a part of this and just shows you um, the, the first one. Um, so I'll, let's see, go back to sharing the screen from our studio. Uh, and, and that is how you would conduct individual based rarefaction. Uh, and actually, uh, I, should go, uh, I should go back to that for just a moment because what I wanted you to notice is that um, on the x-axis here is number of samples. That's the number of individuals that were um, collected in each of those samples. And then expected species richness is, is the accumulation of species that, that occurred in each of those. Okay, so we're rarifying across the number of individuals that were collected. I want to con that's, I remember, individual-based rarefaction, but I want to contrast that with this next thing that I'm going to show you. Go back to our studio here. Um, the next thing that we'll go over is sample-based. Um, and, and then the extension beyond that is coverage-based. And, and for that, we're going to use um, this, actually the same function, this ecotest.sample. Okay? Um, but first, let's talk about the data that we're creating here. So uh, I'm going to create an object called clouds that's uh, created using the subset function on the Chiapas um, data set that we included. I'm gonna set region as not equal to the El Trifo, which means that it's going to be the other two regions. So that's what this exclamation point equals to, that it's not equal to. Uh, and so we should get two regions that are, that's excluding um, this region that's shown here. So if we run that, uh, we get this new object called clouds with 124 observations of uh, 376 variables. Um, so no notice we removed essentially 100 observations that came from um, the um, designated region. So then we're creating an object that's called sample-based ecological, um, the sample-based ecological null hypothesis based on species richness or um, hill number of zero. So a, a, as I mentioned, the function that we use is this ecotest.sample. 
Uh, we're running it on this data set called clouds, but notice that we are dropping that first column that represents the region. And then notice this is by equals, and I'm using that same um, column that we want to exclude from the analysis as the column that identifies the two regions that we want to consider. And so what we're um, essentially doing here is thinking about species accumulation within one region versus the other region. Um, and, and then the margin equals one represents the same um, structure to the data where species are the columns and then the samples taken from each of the regions are rows. Method here equals sample representing sample based species accumulation. The next thing that we'll go over is coverage based. So you just change that argument that is uh, within the quotations from sample to coverage to go between sample based, which is the, the probably most traditional form of rarefaction versus the, the newer coverage based. Uh, and here we're just going to stick with species richness. Okay. Um, so I'll run that. Notice we're going through our iterations again. The, the default here is um, 200. You can specify a number of iter iterations within your arguments. If you do question mark ecotest.sample, you can get all of the defaults that are hidden behind what it's running here, including number of iterations equals 200. It tells us that it's sample based and it gives us our p value. I'll show you one more plot here. Uh, if we run this and then I share the screen um, that that came up on um, what you should see is something that looks very similar here um, this is the distribution of randomized um, iterations the 95 comp percent confidence interval and then notice that our observed z value is much larger so we conclude that there is a significant difference in species uh, the, the um, num functional number of species between these two regions uh, this lower left here showing um, this is um, it says expected coverage, but this is the number of samples that were um, collected from each from from the first region and the second region, and it's comparing those to um, the pooled species accumulation there. And then it shows just one of the randomizations, and remember there's 200 of those that occurred. Um, so I'm just going to go back to our studio, um, and as I mentioned, you can change this to coverage based by um, really only changing the method equals quotes around coverage as opposed to sample. Um, so if, if you find yourself in a situation where you're interested in using sample base versus coverage base, you use the same, um, the same function, you just change that one argument. Okay, and we can run that. Um, and notice that it takes a little bit longer to run the um, coverage based samples, there's a bit more of a calculation that has to happen there. Uh, and so it takes a, a little bit of time to run these 200. Of course, you can run a smaller number of iterations to save time, but uh, the compromise there is that it may not be as accurate compared to doing a large number of iterations. Thus, the, the, the null is 200, a relatively large number. Uh, so we're about halfway through. I don't know if I've mentioned this, but I'm having to do all of these lectures in my garage, and maybe you can hear the neighbors mowing the mowing this grass, and hopefully that's not creating too much of a distraction. Um, there's not much left to this um, lecture. Uh, I'll, I'll show you the plot from this coverage-based sample, and then we'll move on to the biogeographic null hypothesis. But um, this is about all there is to, to this package in terms of implementation. There's, there's a lot you could dive into if you go into the help resources, um, but, but actually running these models is, is, is uh, pretty straightforward. This is a very nice package and, um, and pretty streamlined. So there are 200 randomizations are done. We've got our p-value there suggesting um, there's a significant difference between these two regions based on coverage-based rarefaction. And we'll just run the plot on that as one final example. Because um, I do want you to see that the shape of the curves differs. So, click on this one. Uh, so, so, notice this part does not change. It's a significant p value. So, our observed is outside the 95% confidence intervals of the randomizations. But, notice when we think about coverage, now we're thinking about on um, a proportion between zero and one. And notice that curve is almost um, straight in this case. And it's telling us that our hill number is Q equals one in this case. Um, that's the other thing that I changed was instead of using 
species richness, I changed the response to, um, this is the exponential Shannon, so, so hill number Q equals one. Uh, but but the um, analyses are still functionally the same. We're still comparing the area between the two sampling regions in the pool of data, and this is just one example of, of what that looks like. But go back to sharing our studio screen. Um, that's what happens when you change Q equals to one, and you can explore this and change that to Q equals two if you're interested, and the inverse of the Simpson index. Um, the last thing that I'll show you is just when, when you're um, in the situation where you're thinking about differences in species accumulation between two samples or two regions um, that, that um, differ in their species composition, but you still have a question about um, richness or relative abundance profiles, you can use this other test, the biogeographic null hypothesis. Uh, and so here's sample base, biogeographic, um, with a, um, Q0. So you can name these tests anything you want, but this is in the um, tutorials for this package. This is the, the kind of terminology that you might see if you're using this package and you use the, the internal health structure. Um, so the function is called um, BioG test with a capital um, T dot sample. And if you just run it on the same um, clouds that we created earlier, um, then um, notice I, I knocked down the number of iterations. So this is the argument you use to specify the number of iterations. Um, I, I just cut it in half because it takes a little bit of time to run. But if we run that, um, notice that it's, it's moving pretty slow there. The same argument, um, margin equals one, uh, again, represents the fact that species are columns and, and collections of rows. Uh, margin equals two would, would just reverse the two. So you don't have to change the structure of your data. You can just change this argument within the function um, to, to just tell the function how to read this data. Um, so that's all there is to it. This uh, iteration is going to only run up to 100 because I changed the n iter to equals 100. It'll spit out a p-value and we have a, a conclusion there about um, the, uh, in this case, sample-based accumulation of, um, of effective number of species based on the biogeographic um, null hypothesis. Um, so notice now that we have a non-significant p-value, and there's even a warning that comes from this. Um, in this warning, you can, um, you can it, it just tells you there, you can type in warnings, open and close parentheses, and it's gonna tell you something about what's creating those warnings. And, um, this happens when you have agreement between the pooled data uh, and, the rare, and the randomized data. Remember, a warning is different from an error. A warning is, hey, there's some caveat you should keep in mind. An error, on the other hand, um, would represent a failure of the function. So here we can interpret these warnings and um, keep that in mind as we interpret the data, but it shouldn't be a problem. Anyway, thanks for your attention. I'll try to time these lectures in the future when people are not mowing the grass, and hopefully that wasn't too much of a distraction. Um, and I'll, um, I'll see you next time.